All right, I think we're rolling. Let's get part three going. So this is the chapter three, part three, the z-score and normal distribution lecture, part three. I'm really hitting this a lot in these lectures. I hope you watch them. I hope you work out the problems for yourself and not just look at the answers. There's going to be a lot of problems in this one, lots and lots of examples, um, lots of exercises. I can't make you do them, but if you can do them by yourself, then you're set for the rest of the semester as far as this stuff goes. It'll give you a big big important skill that you need for everything else this semester. I mean, I'm not kidding. If you can't do this, the rest of the semester is going to be confusing and weird and you're going to hate it and you're probably going to fail if you can't do this stuff. So you really should be able to do these exercises. Um, try to do them when I pause. Pause the recording. Get a full answer for yourself. Then look at the recording and see if your answer fits with what I say the answer is. And if I'm wrong, let me know. <coughs> so Let's do some z-score problems. And what you don't understand about z-scores might become apparent as we do these problems. So let's say geese um, often fly south, and the mean number of geese, which I made up off the top of my head per group, is 8, with a standard deviation of 2.4. So if the units of observation is a group of geese. You've measured hundreds and hundreds of groups. This group has 12, this group has 5, this group has 15, this group has 2, etc. So the mean is 8, and the standard deviation is 2.4. How often, now how often, is probability? So as soon as I say how often, you should think, ah, oh, I need to find some area under the normal curve. So how often would we expect to see more than 12 geese? Notice that I mentioned a range. These questions don't work if I said to see exactly 12 geese. Those, those don't work for the normal distribution approximation. So how often would we expect to see more than 12 geese flying south at once. And then I have to mention, or else you can't use the normal distribution, that the distribution of the number of geese per group is approximately normal. So we can pretend like this distribution is a true normal distribution, and we know that we'll only be off by a little bit if we do that. So we're going to use the normal distribution to estimate. So here's the basic engine of problems that we talked about before. If we want to convert our raw score into a z-score, we need to use the formula, and then once we find the z-score, we look it up here. So our raw score, our, our x is 12, the mean is 8, the standard deviation is 2.4. So you work that out, 1.67. 12 is 1 and 2 thirds standard deviations, if that's the standard deviation, above the mean of 8. So what do we do with that number? What well, we look up in the table in the back of the book. So we look in the normal probability table. We need to look in the positive z one. This is a positive z-score. So we find the row labeled 1.6 because that's the first part of our z-score. And then that has like 10 possibilities. And the column there that says 0.07 because that's the last part of our z-score here. The area below z of x is 0.9525. In other words, we found a z-score up here. And the table tells us this area down here. Now, we don't want to know that. We need to know the area above that because the problem says, how often would we expect to see more than 12? More than means from there on up. Don't get hung up on 12 or more or more than 12 because in a density distribution, an individual value is so thin it has no meaning in itself. So more than 12 or 12 and more are equivalent in this particular case. So. We know the area below z, but we want to know the area above or beyond z. And so we just take 1 minus. So if the area below z is 0.95, if all this is 0.95, then this must be 1 minus 0.95. So 1 minus 0.9525 is 0.0475. And if we want to turn that into percentages that people can understand a little easier than proportions, we would say 4.75% of the time we would expect to see groups of geese of 12 or more, or more than 12, flying south. We should only see that less than 5% of the time. So it's not a very common thing. Less than 1 in 20 times we should see that. As long as you believe these numbers that I made up and didn't even bother to look up on the Internet. Because I know nothing about geese. They, they fly. That's all I know. Now in R, we can be a little bit more precise. And we can calculate and find that the area is actually 0.95221 above there. And then 1 minus will give us a different value. So the table value is what we get here. Oh, sorry, it's 0.95 below. So the table value gives us the area below our z-score. And 1.6 z-score is here, so this is 1.67 there. But we really want to know 
this area above here. And so we had to take 1 minus. So our 12 geese, and here's the raw score values more or less. Uh, it gives weird non-whole numbers, this function I wrote. So 12 is right there. Um, 12 geese, the area below that, if you turn it into z-scores, which you did but using the formula, you found a z-score of 1.67. Um, the area below that is 0.95 something. And the area above it is about 0.05 something, a little less than 0.05. So let's use another, do another one. If the average American has an IQ of 100 with a standard deviation of 15, and the distribution is approximately normal, actually it's quite normal. So that's the distribution you're working with, that's the population. Then what is the probability that if you randomly selected an adult, like from the American population, if there were 350 million names in a hat and you drew one, What's the probability that that person would have an IQ of 65 or lower? Um, yeah, enter as a probability. This is left over from a previous class where we did this with clickers. So what's the probability that the adult would have an IQ of 65 or lower? I will, I'll wait before I go on to the solution. All right, I'm done waiting. Um, so let's go back to that basic engine. We want to use the raw score to find a z-score because, and we don't care about the z-score, we just care about the z-score so that we can find an area. Because let's look back at this problem. We know the distribution. We know it's normal and it has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. That's all we need to know. And now we know we can find areas. So what's the probability, that's an area, that a randomly selected adult would have an IQ of 65 or lower? So we're going to have a normal distribution and we're going to have a cutoff line at 65 and we want to find the area from there to the left, no matter how far left that goes. Because lower just means to the left. It's not relative to the mean, it's just left. So we need to take our raw score. And before we can find areas, we need to find a z-score. Because the table of areas needs a z-score to look it up. So we use the formula, 65, which is our x value, minus 100, divided by 15, negative 2.33. It's a negative z-score. So in the table, we look up in the negative z-score table. This book has a really weird z-score table. Every book you use will have a different theory of how they should do the z-score table. We look in the row for negative 2.3, because that's the first part, and the column for 0.03, because that's the last part here, and the area below or beyond z. I say below because it's to the left, but beyond because it's going to be away from the mean is 0 0.0099, so about 0 0.01. And that's what we want to find out. So about 1% of the time, we should find a person who has an IQ of 65 or below. Now, in R, it's a little more precise. Let's just demonstrate what happened here. The distribution has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Um, and here's some raw score values that go along with this. Uh, we found a score of 65, or we imagined a score of 65. We found the z-score for that, which was negative 2, and this is negative 5, so it's not quite there, it's negative 2.33. And the table told us the area. Actually, R here told us the area, which is slightly less than what the table told us, but that's, it's pretty close. So, next one. What is the best estimate of the percentage of Americans, percentage, you're going to find an area under the normal curve, who would score between 30 and 70 on the civics test? And let's say that from a randomly stratified sample of citizens, which will give us an idea, a pretty good idea of um, the actual values in the population, we assume that the population scores on this test have a mean of 27 and a standard deviation of 15. So let's assume those are population values because that's our best guess. Even though it was just a sample, we're going to say it's good enough for us to use that as a guess. Okay, so let's do the solution. Percentage score be between this and this. So we're going to have to find two z-scores, and we're going to use subtraction to find the difference between the areas that each score gives us. Not subtract the z-scores. The z-scores just find us a place in the distribution. Then the distribution gives us areas, and we subtract one area from the other. So again, we're going to use this problem, this process. And we're going to, for the first score, 30, we're going to say how far is that away from the mean of 27 with a standard deviation of 15? It's 0.2. It's a positive 0.2. It's 0.2 standard deviations above the mean. So we look in the positive z table, row 0 0.2, column 0, because that's it. And the area below that is 0 
Now, let me tell you, when you have a difference between two um, areas and you're trying to find between this and this, you just find either the area below both or the area above both. Never m below one and above the other. No, below both or above, above both. And since the table tells you below by default, just go ahead and take that. And then for 70, we find its z-score is 2.87. And again, it's positive. We look in the probability table. The row is 2.8, and the column 0.07, and the area below is 0.9972. So we subtract. So the area below this is 0.99, almost 0.1. And the area below this is 0.58. So we subtract to find the area between the two. I'll show you a graphic of that in a minute. So if you subtract that, you get 0.4179. So about 41.8% of Americans should be expected to get a score between 30 and 70 on that civics test. Now in R, um, for the first one, for a score of 30, the table area gave us below x equals 30. So here's our z-score of 0 0.2. Um, and when we looked up the area below 70, this was, you can see there's only a teeny bit white here. When you get up high enough, the graph can't show you because it's too close to the, the axis. It's t such a skinny probability. And so we want the area between those. So this area is 0.57, so about 58%. And this area is about 99.9%, 99.8%. So if we take this area and we subtract out this area, or we subtract out this area, so we take all this and we subtract this, then what we're left with is this chunk here. And that's 41.8%, is that right? Yeah. So that's how you do the two z-score area between two z-scores type problem. So that's the answer, that area between the green and under the curve. Oh, there was the mean too. Here's the rest of the stuff that was supposed to go in there. Okay. Okay, so another one. What is the probability of randomly selecting a community mental health client with a BDI, Beck Depression Inventory, score of 5 or greater? Now that distribution is approximately normal with a mean of 8.74 and a standard deviation of 9.7. So the numbers aren't nice, but your calculator can deal with them just fine. I'm going to pause. Okay, moving on. Again, probability, so you want an area and you have an x value, a specific value. What's the area of this on up to positive infinity? Greater means just to the right. No matter where this is, it's to the right. So what's the probability of getting a score of this or greater? It's the area of wherever this is in the distribution and off to the right. That's what you need to find. So you use the formula to find the z-score. 5 minus this. So, there's, so this has a negative z-score associated with it. The z-score of 5 in this distribution is negative 0.39. So in the table, we look up that z-score to find up the area below it. And so we use the negative z-table because it's negative. Row negative 0 0.3, column 0 0.09. And the area beyond z, um, this is negative. So area beyond or below z going down is 0.3483, almost 0.35. So we know the area below z, but we actually want the area above or to the right of z. So we want the other part of the distribution. So we do 1 minus. We do the complement. We do the, uh, the not. So this is the people below a score of 5. So we want the people not below a score of 5, in other words, above. So 0.6517. So about 65%. 65 0.2%, a probability of 0.65. So a lot of people get a score above that. So uh, here we go. The table gives you this area. And what we want to know is, over, is that big white area there, mean of 8.74, standard deviation of whatever that was. Our raw score of 5 gives us a z-score right there, negative 0.39. And so the area, about 0.35. And we had to do 1 minus to figure out this stuff here. So the table gave you z below, or area below z. So z -score scores can work for any distribution, but only sometimes can we use the normal approximation. You have to look for clues in the data. Um, 
if the histogram is, is pretty symmetrical, taller in the middle and kind of has a bellish-like shape, then go ahead and use the normal distribution. Uh, look for clues. Oh, we're not doing homework. Leftover. Uh, clues in test problems and quiz problems and class activities. If I say approximately normal or normally distributed, then yes, use the normal distribution. So what if it's really non-normal? If, if there's a clear skew or some crazy outliers or something like that, then do not use this. Don't use this process. This is only for distributions that are pretty normal. And the more non-normal it is, the more wrong your answers will be. Sometimes we don't care how, how accurate our answers are. If they're kind of close enough, that's fine. But sometimes it's a really big deal. We just don't want to be that kind of wrong. So if you have all the data, then it doesn't matter. You don't need the normal distribution. You just look in your computer and use R or SPSS or something, and you just ask for frequencies. You say, what percentage of people have a score above this? And the computer's like 33%. It do, you don't have to use an approximation under those conditions. You have the data right in front of you. You can just count. But this is for situations where we don't have the data in front of us. We're either imagining something that we, that we don't have access to, or we only have a sample and we know we have some reasonable estimate of population values and we're trying to estimate. So if you only have a sample and your, and your distribution is really non-normal, then you have a big problem. For right now, you can do nothing about it. Later, we'll talk about the central limit theorem, which can help quite a bit, but we're not going to do that right now. There are also some advanced statistical methods that use the data in front of you and resample it over and over again to get some good estimates of what might happen. And those have been shown to be extremely useful. Bootstraps, jackknifes, that kind of thing. Resampling methods. We're not going to cover these in this class. If anybody's interested, I'll be glad to talk to you about them uh, outside class. They're a lot of fun. They're a robust solution. So using the normal distribution is not ro a robust process because as soon as your stuff is non-normal, you're screwed. So these kinds of things here, like using the bootstrap and, the, and jackknifes and other simpler, similar resampling methods are robust. Now, what if you're lazy and you don't want to use that table? And I'm very lazy. I don't like using tables. Then we can take shortcuts with R. And unless I tell you otherwise, you'd never have to use the table if you can use R instead. Now, you either need the table or R or a fairly advanced understanding of calculus and have the normal curve formula memorized. So the table or R, probably. Um, but R is simpler. So instead of these two jumps, we can just use one function in R. That function is p-norm. In other words, give me the probabilities in the normal distribution. And if we know an area or a proportion or percentage and we want to find the raw score that goes with it, there's another function, q-norm. Give me the quantiles, in other words, the x's in the normal distribution. So we can skip the x. x disappears. So let's see how that works here. Um, here's, let's do the geese example. Why did I put that here? Okay, so we did all this business. Let's do the shortcut with R. The way p-norm works is you put in the cutoff value, the, the x value, the value that makes a line somewhere in your distribution that you want to find the area above or below. So you put that, the, the dividing point, the x value. And then you put mean equals and the mean of the distribution, sd equals and the standard deviation of the distribution. Remember, it's 8 geese per group is the mean, 2.4 geese per group is the standard deviation. And then there's, some, there's a function that, or an argument that's lower dot tail, all in lowercase letters. If it's true, not in quotation marks, or if you leave it out, it's always true, then it'll give you the area below whatever this is here. If you say false, then it'll give you the area above. So if we type this in here, then it gives us this answer. It won't give you these pretty graphics. Uh, if anybody wants this function, I can give this to you, but this is something I wrote. It'll just give you the number. It'll just say... 0.04779. So that's that's what it's giving us. It's just going to give you 0 0.04779, but this is what it means, is that in a normal distribution of a mean of 8, standard deviation of 2.4, the area above that is uh, above a value of 12 is 0 0.04779. So this um, example of Americans having IQ, etc., I'll give you a minute and you can use p norm to figure that out if you like in r which is a nice little skill to have it might help you do something really fast in class sometime okay 
So the function, as you write it, the command should be pnorm 65. That's the value you want to find the area above or below. And the mean is 100. Standard deviation is 15. You could put comma lower dot tail equals true, but that's the default. It's always set to true unless you tell it otherwise. So just leave it out, and it'll tell you the lower tail, because we want to find the area below that. And so this is the result that it gives us. Mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, x equals 65, the area below is 0.00982. So 9.98%. Point, point about 1%, I guess. Okay, now this one, area of estimate of percentage of Americans between 30 and 60 on this test that has a mean of 27.15. I'll pause for a minute. Okay, so you'd need two p norm func function arguments, no, sorry, commands here. Um, you'd use 30 and 70, otherwise they'd be the same. It doesn't matter if you say lower tail is true or lower tail is false. So let's just leave it at true, which is the default, as long as you subtract the smaller one from the larger one. And so this will give you two areas. It'll give you this one, 0.57926 and 0.99793 and you can just subtract. And so everything is exactly the same as it was in the previous uh, example. And this will give you, if you subtract them, then that will give you the area of this part of the curve right here, which is the area, the proportion or probability of selecting an American getting a score between 30 and 70. And then the BDI example, I'll just pause for a second. All right, so we use p-norm again. Uh, this time, we put in 5, because that's our cutoff value, and then the mean and the standard deviation. And we say lower tail equals false, because we want to know the percentage of people who are scoring above this, not below this. And so this is, it's going to give you this value here, and I have my function to draw this pretty thing here. So the mean is 8.74. Our particular raw score is, is uh, 5, and the area above that is 65%, 0 0.65. I don't know why I have an extra shortcuts with our thing. Um, I'm going to do a few more exercises here. I know this is going long, but this is just all exercises all the time. I don't think there's any more content here. We're just doing exercises here. We might do a reverse z-score one here. Oh, that's why. Because going backwards, q-norm. So let's remember that, because there will be a few exercises like that. So let's say what percentage of women are 60% of shorter? You need some information. So it's an approximately normal distribution. Here's the mean and standard deviation. And then I said 60% are shorter, so now x equals 60 inches. Sorry, not 60%, 60 inches are shorter, 5 feet tall. Apparently women are tall, 5 foot 4 on average. What's the information needed? You need to find out what percentage of women are less than 60 inches tall. So what quantity can we calculate? Well, we can find the percent of area under the normal curve, a range of scores. And a lot of this is redundant here. We've talked about it. And you need the lower end going down to negative infinity. The upper end is bounded at 60 inches. So a line at 60 inches, and then the area going down to the very bottom of the distribution forever to the left. So we'd say z of 60 inches. So find the area below z of 60 inches, below the z score that corresponds to the raw score of 60 inches. I'll pause. Okay. So here's a diagram. And I want you guys to get in the habit of drawing these diagrams. You don't have to draw all these lines inside, but a little normal curve thing, even if it looks like an upside down bowl, label the mean, label the standard deviation somewhere, which I didn't hear, and put the value that you're that divides the distribution, so 60 inches, put it on the correct side of the mean. You know 60 inches is less than 64, so you can put it to the left of 64 and then shade in the area you're trying to find. So get in the habit of making these diagrams. They're very useful. So shortcuts with R. Easy peasy. You can do the table if you want, but I'm going to do it this way. So P norm, 60, mean of 64, standard deviation of 2.4. What that will give us is the area below, because we didn't say lower tail is false, so we leave it as lower tail is true. So that's our score. In the area, 0 0.04779. I think we've seen that number before. So a percentage of women 66 inches or shorter. Approximately normal, blah, 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 same distribution. 
you need to find the percentage less than 66 inches. Why did I do that twice? I don't remember. I should edit this. So the range of the area we're going to find is from 66 inches to negative infinity. So we're going to look for the area less than 66 inches. Here's a diagram. Now 66 is above the mean of 64, so you should put a line to the right. It doesn't really matter where, it's just a diagram. To the right of 64. You don't have to have these standard deviation lines because you don't know, but you should have a mean line. Um, and you should write the standard deviation in there somewhere. Like just write 2.4, sigma equals 2.4. And shade this in because this is the area we need to find to answer this question. So with our shortcuts, p norm 66, mean of 64, that will give us an area of about 80%, 79.77%. So a mean of 64, a value of 66, what's the area below? About 79.77%. So 79.8%, almost 80% of women are shorter than 66 inches. So find the percentage of women 61 inches and taller in this distribution. The same normal distribution, the same mean and standard deviation, but this time our x value is 61. So we need to find the percent greater than 61 or taller than 61 inches. So the range is going to be from 61 inches to positive infinity this time. And try and think to yourself which side of the distribution so you could say 1 minus the area below 61 inches, or you could use the function and use lower dot tail equals false and get the same thing. So the mean is 64. 61 is to the left of that, but we need to know the area to the right of 61. So it's going to go across the mean. It's going to be the majority of the distribution. So your diagram should look something like this. You should write standard deviation equals 2.4 somewhere. So Easy peasy, p norm 61, same thing you did before, but remember to do lower dot tail equals false. Or you could do 1 minus without lower tail equals false, you'll get the same answer. So here, 89.4%. And so almost 90% of women are 61 inches or taller, 5 foot 1 or taller. <coughs> now here's a reverse z score problem. <coughs> and we will encounter these in areas like confidence intervals. You need to know how to do this because confidence intervals rely on this logic. The way the problem works is you're given an area and you need to find a raw score, so backwards from what we've done so far. So we could say, how tall are the tallest 86% of women? This is hard to parse. Answering this question is a little weird, but I think a, ra a reasonable way to say is they are such and such and taller, right? So you need that lower value. They are five foot ten and taller, or something like that. So you need that number. I said five foot ten, but that's totally not the right answer. So we know the area. We don't know what divides that area, what cuts off that area within the distribution. We know the area is eighty six percent though. So we we're given that it's an approximately normal distribution, the same distribution parameters and we need to know the percent and we already know sorry the percent above x is 86 so what is this x that cuts off the 86 percent or the proportion is 0.86 whatever you know and remember it's always going to be proportions and probabilities once you start working with r even though we flip-flop verbally so we need to know x for the 100 minus 86 percent percentile or with r you don't need to know that you can just use lower tail and upper tail and life is good but we do need to know x that cuts off the range of the z value of x or something to, um, sorry, that should say to positive infinity. Let me just fix that. Okay. So x for the 14th percentile, because percentile means area below or just x using the, f the function to find the range from z to positive infinity. So 86% is the area below z, but we need to find, oh sorry, Man, that's another er error. Errors all over the place. 86% is the area above z, sorry about that. And we need to find x, the height in inches, for this z of x, for the second z for some reason. The answer is going to be a range of heights, but 
but it will all be defined by one number that says from this number and on up. This is the heights. So the diagram could look something like this. You could say 0.86. This is the tallest 86% of women. They are from this height and on up to maximum. So if you wanted to do hand calculation, you would use the normal probability table. You would find the z of x that goes with 0.86. That's the same as finding the negative z for 1 minus 0.86, so the negative z that has 0.14 below it. So on the negative z column, you find a, an, an entry, if you hunt around it, it says 0 0.1401, and you notice it's in the row negative 1.0, column 0 0.08, so you have a z-score then of negative 1.08, so that's your z-score. And then to turn that into an x, you just use this formula, and it's 61.41 more or less. And that's your answer, 61.41 inches. You're done. So the tallest 86% of women are 61.41 inches and taller, uh, up to the maximum. You don't have to know what the maximum is. So using R, you use Q norm. You put in an area as a proportion, Q norm 0.86, mean equals 64, S equals 2.4, and you do lower dot tail equals false. So it would give you the value so find the point that cuts the distribution in half with 86% above that point in the top half. Otherwise, it'll give you the wrong number. So there you go. <coughs> so what's the percentage of women between 62 uh, to 64 inches? Blah, blah, blah. Same thing, but we have two Xs, 62 and 64. So there's some percentage between 64 and 62. So we need a range of values, so we need to know an area. So this is a forward z problem. So we're just going to take the two values and subtract the areas. So our diagram might look like this. We have 62, and 64 is actually the mean. So it's between 62 and the mean. So we're really only going to have to look up one thing. If you remember that 64 inches is the mean, then you won't have to actually look that up. that's what's going to happen. So you could find the area above this and then the area above this and subtract this from the first one and you'd be left over. You could also do that for areas below, but I didn't make a fun diagram for that. Um, so anyway, here's your diagram. And the z-score for 62, if you calculate it out, it turns out to be negative 0.83. And the z-score for 64 is 0. So anyway, if you look at the area above or below this, it's going to be uh, 0.5, and the area below this will be something else. Subtract that out from 0.5. The result should be about 0.2967. So I'll just run through a few more examples here without too much commentary. I didn't make fancy graphics for all of them. The percent of women's from 63 inches to 67 inches. Approximately normal. Two values. Find the area between them. I'm not consistent in my notation. That's a bad problem. So find the area between the z-score for 63 inches and the z for 67. You don't have to use z-scores. You can use um, r-norm, or sorry, p-norm for this. So the area below z of 67 minus the area below... <laughs> more errors? So many errors in my slides. That's my problem minus the area below z is 63. There's a lot of possibilities. This is just maybe the simplest one. You can do the areas above, the areas to the mean, whatever. So 63 and 67. And you just want to find that area between them. So if you work this out, you should end up with a z-score here of 1.25 and this of negative 0.41. Ooh, did I even write down the answer? Nope, I'll let you figure that out. So finding the area of less than something or less than or equal to something, don't worry about it. It's the same thing when you're talking about these normal approximations. Plus, it's an approximation. The percentile of x is always to the left. It's always below x, always to the left. Whether x is to the left or the right of the mean, percentile means from x all the way to the left forever. 
percent below x is area below z y you know you already know how to do all this kind of stuff lower numbers are always to the left higher numbers to the right so if the problem is saying lower or higher or greater or less you're talking about left and right but sometimes we say beyond the mean so sometimes we talk about beyond x and that means going away from the mean to x and then from x further away from the mean and sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative so this terminology could get confusing there's no such thing as truly normal everything we do is an estimate if the data are very non-normal then we should not use this method okay I have last two exercises even though this has gone on for an hour and a half now <coughs> you can do as many or as few of these as you like um, scores on the MMPI depression scale mean of 50 standard deviation of 10 you give this scale to a client who just lost her father her score is 64 the clinical cutoff is usually 70 so what percentage of the adult population would score between her score and the clinical cutoff you're saying to herself should I just bump her up and say yeah she's depressed I mean this is not really how we make decisions but still what percentage of people actually score between 64 and 70 that might help answer the question I'm not going to give you the answer here but you can do this backwards same scale a client tells you she scored in the 65th percentile but she can't remember the score so what was her score and now let me just look ahead here really quickly and let's stop for good